Hello, everyone. I'm going to get us started. We have one hour, and the topic is uh, discovering global health careers. So we're going to be exploring the nature of your professional life and some of the uh, ways to make that work for you. Um, we're going to spend an hour together doing that, and how we're going to do it is um, I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to introdu introduce our speakers, and then uh, each of us will have about 10 minutes or so to talk about our programs and to share a few key messages and things that we've learned along the way that we think are important for you to know as you're navigating your careers, either uh, early uh, startup career or mid-career, or you're trying to figure out how to um, work uh, your life towards the end of your professional life. Um, I want to talk about the, the uh, presenters and introduce them to you. Uh, aren't they, don't we look good? Did you see those pictures? We look, in, I mean, we look fabulous. So um, first I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Jessica Evert. Um, Dr. Evert straddles international education and medical, and the medical profession. She's the executive director of, and we do like our acronyms in global health, CFHI, which is Child Family Health International. Uh, she's a long time, she's a practicing physician. She's a long time advocate for health related international education quality and ethical standards. She's a massive writer. She's written some of the best stuff in the field. And I brought one of her books from my office, Developing Global Health Programming, and this is Reflection in Global Health. <laughs> I'm writing a book chapter for her next book right now. Uh, and we've uh, presented and been on panels together in the past around this subject. I also want to introduce to you Barbara Bush, who's the CEO and co-founder of the Global Health Corps. Uh, she's going to be telling you about the Global Health Corps, what that, what that organization is. Um, the Global Health Corps are partners in the project that I run, the Global Health Fellows Program. And so I've worked with Barbara for uh, several a number of years now, four, four years or so. Um, she's worked at the, Sm at the Smithsonian in design thinking programs for high school students. She works with UNICEF. Um, she's on the steering committee and of uh, the next generation of UNICEF. I probably got that wrong. Uh, she's a board uh, member of a number of organizations. Uh, she's um, worked in the field of global health now extensively. Uh, in 2011, and sorry, 2011, she was named one of Glamour Magazine's Women of the Year. Uh, in 2013, she was recognized as one of Newsweek's Women of Impact. And in last year, she was named to Fast Companies, one of my favorite magazines, Most Creative People in Business list. I actually sort of hate you right now, Barbara. <laughs> just like, you know, just, no, just, just, a, just a little bit, just a little bit. But um, the reason, I, I asked Social Impact, uh, who runs this through the uh, Global Health um, Professional Organizational Development Program, if we could do a panel on global health careers, as they usually do. And uh, they agreed. And I thought, oh, like, who would I want to be on this panel? Uh, because I want this hour to be meaningful and important and uh, for important things to be shared. And these are the two women that I work with that I deeply respect. Um, they are uh, super smart. They, have, they are passionate about a vision that they have. And they are willing to speak truth to power. And they, I've seen both of them do it, and uh, it's impressive. And they are one of us. I, I'm supposed to say something about myself. I just realized I forgot. OK. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, spent my first career in cross-cultural communication and adaptation, which took me to Europe and Asia and um, Latin America. I then spent um, a number of years at Johns Hopkins working in Anglophone Africa in the area of behavior change communication, uh, client-provider interaction, 
and then uh, years in out of cha working out of Chapel Hill globally uh, for intra health on um, training and performance improvement. But for the last 15 years, I've been really focused on the recruitment and performance management of global health professionals and building the next generation of global health professionals. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, Barbara, okay. who's going to talk about Global Health Core. And, and while we queue up her uh, presentation, I just want to check in with the group. How many of you are Thank you. I'll now, I'll now sing a short song. I would, do that to you. I would not do that to you. Um, how many of you are fluent in a second language? Yay. Okay, I am so bad at languages that I'm deeply impressed when somebody actually can do that. How many of you can speak more than three languages? All right, I hate all of you. I'm just saying right now. How many of you have already lived and worked overseas? Okay, massive. So we're basically, this room seats about 300 people. We have 300 experts in the room, so we're gonna involve them as well. Sounds good. Well, hi everyone. Um, as Sharon mentioned, I'm Barbara, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Global Health Corps. At Global Health Corps, we have a few Global Health Corps fellows and alums in the room. Will you all raise your hand really fast? Yay, three. Um, at Global Health Corps, we're building the next generation of global health leaders who share a common belief, and that is the belief that health is a human right. Um, the fact that y'all are all in this room is part of why we started Global Health Corps. I, it's a little bit surprising to me if I was y'all's age, I'm unfortunately older than I think many of the people in here, I would never have thought that I would be standing on a stage talking about global health. Um, growing up, I was obsessed with design and I had studied architecture and I always thought that that's where my career would take me, that I would end up being an architect and sort of building great spaces that would facilitate community. And when I was in college, um, I graduated from college 10 years ago, you, global health programming, you couldn't major in global health and there were very few global health classes. Obviously, that's shifted enormously over the past 10 years, which is a huge opportunity um, because so many young people are interested in global health and obviously we need more people in the field of global health. So I think that's a huge benefit to what the field will look like. Um, but when I was in college, it wasn't an option to major in global health. And um, I was really lucky to take two weeks off of my sort of fancy summer internship working in design in New York for the launch of PEPFAR. And at that time, I think as many of y'all know, um, if you were living on the continent of Africa and you were HIV positive, HIV was a death sentence. And it wasn't because we didn't know how to treat people with HIV. It wasn't because we didn't know how it was spread. It was purely because drugs that existed were in developed countries. You couldn't get them no matter how wealthy you were in many developing countries. And so I um, took two weeks off of my internship and was really lucky to be on the ground in five countries in East and Southern Africa when PEPFAR, which is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, was being rolled out. And I, um, two things happened. One, I, as an idealistic college student, just could not believe that when we landed, there were hundreds of people waiting in the street and marching in the streets for drugs that had been available in the United States for years. These were people whose lives were cut short because they were born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that infuriated me. And then on the flip side, I met so many unbelievable people that were stepping up to change this status quo. I met plenty of community members, parents, um, US policymakers that just said this was unacceptable and were giving a program that didn't exist a shot. I mean, it was a startup at the time. And flash forward, now 10 million people are alive because of PEPFAR. And um, it really changed the tide on how we see HIV. It's, of, no, of course, no longer a death sentence. It can be a chronic illness, and anyone that is HIV positive can live a full, healthy life. And um, I, that trip, and then flash forward, I went back to university, and my, one of my very favorite professors, who was terrifying, um, 
and I would, I would get so nervous in class thinking about potentially raising my hand. Like oftentimes I wouldn't raise my hand, but I would think about raising my hand and then get so nervous because he was such a great professor, but he knew everything. And so I, it was sort of a, my own internal issue coming up. Um, but he ended up passing away because he was HIV positive. And I went to Yale University, and it was, it's a very well-funded university, and he passed away because he didn't have access to drugs that he needed to live. And so from then on, I became obsessed with global health and just could not work in this field, except I couldn't navigate how to get into this field. I had an architecture background. Um, I took every global health class I could, but at the time, there weren't tons of them offered. And so it's been a very fascinating, very non-linear journey for me to end up on this stage in front of you. Um, and yet we know we need systems thinkers in global health. And I will say that that's what an architecture degree gave me. It gave me an understanding of design thinking and how to understand people that you're building a system for. Um, so flash forward, as Sharon mentioned, I ended up uh, founding Global Health Corps. Um, and we really saw a huge opportunity in the fact that so many young people were interested in global health issues. One of the biggest gaps we have in global health is human capital. And one of the biggest levers for change we have is leadership. And we can think of leadership in many different ways, but I think at Glo in Global Health Corps, we think of it as um, a commitment to social justice, creating leaders that are adaptive and resilient and empathetic alongside being really smart at business acumen and being effective. Um, but I think for us, we really see the critical need for what some people call soft skills, although I think they make you more effective in global health um, as well as effective skill set. So the way that we work is we um, are harnessing young people. We work with people that are 30 and under. We're very generation specific. I was telling Sharon earlier, 30 seemed really old when I started Global Health Corps. <laughs> And then I turned 30 um, and aged out of the program that I run. Um, but we see youth as a huge opportunity because you're not used to a status quo. Um, one of the biggest barriers that we have in global health is people thinking we can't do something because they've been in the same system for so long they don't think of options that might exist outside of it. And so we, um, we partner with existing global health organizations. We partner with organizations in Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, and Zambia, and then in the United States, in Newark, Boston, DC, and New York, because it's really important that we remember that the United States is part of the globe and we have global health issues here. Um, our partners identify their biggest systems gaps, and then we competitively recruit young leaders to work with them for a year filling those gaps. And when we started, we were thrilled because None of our initial partners requested doctors and nurses. They had doctors and nurses on their team. They wanted different skill sets at the table that ensure that they were being as creative as they could about building smarter healthcare systems. And so that really opens up the field to anyone. Um, and I think I could, if any of you, probably all three of us, if any of you told us what your sort of skill set area was, we could tell you how it fits into global health. Um, but that's not to say it's not confusing in terms of how to get your foot in the door. I think it's probably more confusing if you're not a doctor or nurse because there's not necessarily a clear career path for you. Um, but our, our partners are really looking for um, systems skill sets because they want to reach more people effectively, um, which means reaching people before they get sick rather than them, them needing to see a doctor or a nurse. Um, and then. Our program essentially has two parts. Our fellows work every single day with one of our partner organizations, so they're learning while problem solving and learning while navigating really complex systems and learning while navigating the gray area that exists in this space. And then throughout the year, we invest really heavily in our fellows' leadership capacities. Um, we call them leadership practices because none of us ever become a full leader. We always have to practice. Um, soft skills, and that's adaptability, that's collaboration, that is continuing to be committed to social justice and why you do this work, and ensuring that you're connecting with the communities, the people, the issues where transformation is truly happening. Um, and for us, it's not enough to bring great skill sets to the field of global health. It is probably more critical to bring people that will use those skill sets as leaders and do everything that they can to get other people at the table and understand policy change and advocacy and entrepreneurship because those are three modes for impact that come regardless of what your skill set area is. 
Um, so you may wonder what we think global health leaders look like. They don't look like necessarily what you always think they will. Um, quickly, these are two of our fellows that joined us in our first class. It's Amit Salvi on your on the right and Jafari Bulembo on the left. And um, they joined us in our first class of 22 fellows. We've now worked with 600 young leaders. When we met Amit, he was a recent UC Berkeley grad with a degree in engineering, and he had been working for The Gap. And he, obviously, he really saw himself as a global health leader then. Mm -hmm. um, he had been working on The Gap's supply chain. So his job was to get white t-shirts and denim jackets from Gap warehouses into Gap stores across the country. Found out about Global Health Corps, moved to join us in Tanzania, where he was partnered with his co-fellow, Jafari. Our fellows always work in teams of two from two different countries. So there's constant global learning and global communication. Jafari had also had a degree in engineering, and he'd been working for the biggest cell phone distributor in Tanzania. And they joined us to work with the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar, which was a two-person team. And they were serving the one million people living on the island of Zanzibar. When they started with us, 75% um, of the time, someone would get diagnosed with whatever illness they had or disease, and they would go to the pharmacy to get the drug they needed. And 75% of the time, that drug would not be there which meant that something that was treatable would turn into a, a life-threatening illness. And so Amit and Jafari brought their skill set that they used in retail, but this time instead they were serving the one million people on the island of Zanzibar. They were strengthening the drug supply chain. So instead of moving cell phones and clothes from warehouses to stores, they were moving life-saving medication from warehouses into clinics and more importantly into the hands of the patients that need them most. They had honed this skill in the private sector I would argue that it's more impactful in global health. Um, and this really for them was a launching point for understanding how their skill set can affect lives. Jafari continues to work with the Ministry of Health in Zanzibar. Amit continued to hone his skills in Tanzania and Kenya. And then when the Ebola outbreak happened, he moved to Sierra Leone and he now oversees all supply chain and procurement for partners in health there. Um, so this skill set obviously didn't to both of them when they initially started working didn't make sense how they were gonna do this work. Um, now they're building systems that serve people more effectively. Um, and then one other example I wanted to mention are um, the 16 architects that we've worked with through Global Health Corps. Um, half of them are Rwandan, they work in Rwanda, and one third of people in Rwanda are exposed to tuberculosis. As y'all all probably know, TB is airborne. So if one person in this room has TB, we're all exposed to it. And you can imagine what that means when someone feels sick and they go to a health clinic. If they're diagnosed with TB, everyone else in the clinic is exposed to it. And so oftentimes people will go to get well only to leave more ill from a health clinic. And so our fellows that are architects have changed the way that air flows throughout health clinics throughout Rwanda so that TB and other airborne illnesses don't spread. It's a very simple, very cost-effective solution, but this solution wouldn't have come up if there weren't an arc, you know, if someone that didn't understand airflow wasn't sitting at the table. And it's been extremely effective. The Ministry of Health in Rwanda is now having an architect at every meeting where they're discussing blueprints for clinics or hospitals being built because this keeps people healthy rather than needing to train more doctors to treat tuberculosis. Um, I could tell y'all 600 stories up here, obviously, and I really love to talk, so I'm not going to do that just to spare you. Um, but those are, the, those are the stories of a few of our fellows. We've gotten to work with 600 fellows throughout the past five years, three of whom are in this room. Um, and we're thrilled because 97% of them continue to work in global health or social justice following their time with us. So we really are building a great talent pipeline for this field. 10% work with the Minister of Health in the country where they're from. Um, and 22% have effectively changed policy around global health outcomes already. And they're young. I mean, they're still navigating their careers as I'm still navigating my career. Um, and I think hopefully we probably all are always navigating your career, but you just don't know that when you're younger. Turns out your parents actually didn't know everything. They were still navigating their own careers. Um, I've learned that when I turned 30. Um, but I think one thing that I wanna mention is um, we have really seen the power of having different skill sets at the table in global health. And we know from problem solving methodology and problem solving research, you get better solutions when you have more lenses addressing the same problem. And so regardless of what skill sets you have right now, they're necessary in global health. It's hard to navigate how to use them, 
But um, I think that there's m now much more understanding that we need very different people at the table solving health issues. And one other thing um, to think about is that Sharon and I were talking about this this morning, is in the gray area, that's when you grow as a leader. You don't grow when everything is going really well and everything makes sense and your job description is clear. That's not when you experience growth. You experience growth when you're in a messy situation and you're trying to figure out how to navigate it. And so we've thought a lot about how we can gather these experiences of growth. And they don't come when things are working out well. They come when things are failing and you have to step up and try to figure out what to do. And I say this because I imagine that many of you experience a lot of gray area in navigating your own career paths or navigating what you want to do. And the more that you can think about those as growth opportunities and reframe sort of hard things that come your way, that's how you'll actually grow as a leader and end up knowing more about how to be effective in this space. Um, so we can all collect these experiences every day if we want. And I would, I would encourage you to think about collecting them as experiences so you can be effective in this field. So that is that. Thank you. <laughs> so we're Thank you. so we're going to switch uh, the PowerPoint to Jessica's presentation. Uh, meanwhile, I just want to say that we're not going to take any questions until the end. And so if you have some questions that have come up for you as Barbara gave her presentation, I want to recommend that you write them down because you think you're not going to forget, but you will forget. Or the effort that it takes to keep remembering means that you're going to listen less to, to Jessica and me. So uh, we want you to be fully present as we um, talk further. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thanks to Sharon um, and Barbara for um, for having this panel and really, I think, bringing some really important messages to you all and to to all of our consciousness. So I am a family physician. I'm at UCSF in San Francisco. But the big hat that I wear is as Executive Director of Child Family Health International. And abbreviated CFHI, it's an NGO that sends undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate students abroad to experience global health. And we have over 30 programs in 10 countries. I did not found this program. It was founded by a mentor of mine, Dr. Evelyn Jones, um, about 25 years ago. And there's been about 8,000 scholars to date. What's really unique about CFHI is that although there are short-term programs, most students go from anywhere between four and 16 weeks. What we do is we insert you into existing health systems and social service systems so that you're getting a really authentic viewpoint of what global health is day in and day out. And the reason that's so important is captured in the next slide, which is two different definitions of global health. So the first definition was put forth in The Lancet, which is a fairly well-known journal, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, by Jeff Coplin, who's at Emory, and his colleagues. And he suggests that global health is a field of study, research, and practice that places a priority of achieving health e equity and health for all people. Global health involves multiple disciplines within and beyond the health sciences, is a synthesis of population-based prevention with individual level clinical care, promotes interdisciplinary collaboration, and emphasizes transnational health issues and determinants. And that was one definition put forth at a 2008 meeting. Another definition put forth at the same meeting by a Kenyan colleague was that global health is, quote, a concept fabricated by developed countries to explain what is regular practice in developing nations. And there's some rich contrast between those two definitions. But what I want to point out to you is that often in global health, we are working outside of our frame of reference. We are working in communities, in locations that are very different than the ones we were raised in or the ones that we spend most of our time in. And a lot of my thoughts today are going to echo that, that reality and how we can avoid fabricating things and really get to a rich understanding of someone else's reality and a working alongside assets within it. So the first pearl that I have for you is to challenge yourself to recognize and build on assets. And why do we have to do that? Well, we have to do that because often when we land somewhere, whether it's in our own backyard or across the world, that it has less resources, a different standard of living than we're used to, what do we see? When you look at this image, what jumps out at you? Well, I think what jumps out for many people that I speak to about this image is the standing water, 
the trash, the seemingly dilapidated houses. Okay, and that's very natural because psychologically we tune in very quickly to problems. We don't necessarily appreciate the new blue clean water containers. We don't necessarily appreciate that those corrugated roofs are actually an improvement that happened six months ago and they were way worse before that. Okay, because we're seeing a setting in one moment in time and it's very different from what we usually look at. So therefore, we have to be really intentional about how we approach development and engagement. What I'm gonna to propose to you is that I want you to challenge yourself to use an asset or strength-based lens when you're engaging in global health. In development, there's two main modes of development. One is called the deficits model, and that's where you look at problems, you may do a needs assessment, and then you try to fix those problems, okay? And while that can be very consistent with how grant grant applications work at your university are very kind of convenient for the fact that you have three months and you need to get something done, you need to come back and you need to present a poster on what you did. It often is not the most sustainable or locally empowering way to do something. So what I challenge you to do is think about asset models of development, okay? An asset-based community development is actually a very formalized mechanism of development. It was formalized at Northwestern University. And if you're interested in learning more about how to do this, you can go to www.abcdinstitute.org. But what we do when we do asset-based development is that we actually look at for strengths, and we build on those strengths and empower those strengths to work together towards a community-driven end. It can be very challenging because it means that often we don't control what the outcome is or how things are done, but we are more enabling forces. An example of CFHI's programs that, and how we do this, um, these are our programs in India. So we have seven programs in India. They look at a variety of different things from urban rural comparative health to integrated medicine and traditional medical practices to end-of-life care and palliative care. And in the end-of-life care and palliative care program, the medical director is Dr. Raja Gopal. And Dr. Raja Gopal is considered the father of palliative care in India. And you get to spend four to 16 weeks with him and his team learning about how um, they deliver, sorry, I have a friend up here. I'm just gonna let him, I'm like Snow White, like just let him sit on me, okay. So, um, palliative Dr. Raja Gopal is the um, founder of Pallium in Trivandrum in southern India. And he not only practices palliative care clinically, but it, with a multidisciplinary team, but he also is a, a very effective advocate in changing the parliamentary laws in India that that make morphine and other pain relieving medications very difficult to get. And so you learn not only how to, to do global health or health equity in a clinical sense, but also learning how to be an advocate and a leader. Because at the end of the day, clinical practices, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, clinical work, being a doctor, being a nurse, being a clinician, is often not our most effective route to, to affecting and implementing change internationally. The second pearl I want to share with you is to seek to understand the no-do gap. So who's heard of the no-do gap? Okay, a few of you. So the no-do gap is this chasm or the, the disparity between what we know works, what we found in research, what policy tells us, what best practices show, and what actually happens at the community level. So I'll give you an example of this. This is a graph that shows malaria incidence when you, in, when you integrate um, bed nets into a community, insecticide-treated bed nets. So those are bed nets that people sleep under in order to prevent mosquito bites because mosquitoes mostly bite in the evening and night. And so you can see that as you integrate insecticide-treated bed nets into a community, the incidence or how many people get malaria goes down. Great. It works. Awesome. Let's do it. Well, what happens sometimes in practice? Sometimes bed nets are more important as fishing instruments or it's more of a priority to have them used as soccer nets. And that's not wrong. That's just understanding that what we know is supposed to happen and what actually happens is very different. And why that happens is illustrated in what we call the social model of health. So here, the social model of health that you or I are in the middle of red sphere there, our age, our sex, our biology, how our organs are working. But there's multiple levels on top of that that affect whether we're healthy or not. Those include our lifestyle factors, our social and community networks, our living, working conditions, the education that we have access to, 
the healthcare services, clinical healthcare services we have access to, housing, do we have a dirt floor in our house, do we have a roof, are we able to keep the elements out if they're too hot or too cold. And then on that outside rung, we have the socioeconomic, cultural, environmental conditions. So these are wider geopolitical conditions, both within our country and also worldwide. We can also look at what's called the social model, or I actually just made this up, but I think it's a social model of interventions, okay? So interventions, here you have polio vaccine, you have a latrine, you have medications. Our interventions are housed in a, in a similarly complex web of, of social modeling. And so recognizing that and being able to take those into account and not just saying what we know works and expecting that when we deliver it or try to have it happen at the community level that it's gonna work perfectly is really helpful because then we can take the evidence we have and actually integrate it in a way that is um, effective. So this is an example from CFHI program. So CFHI program, one of our programs in Uganda is nutrition, food security, and sustainable agriculture. And this program in part looks at, at the use of rabbits as a novel protein source in southwest Uganda. Well, the World Bank spent about $100 million in the same region integrating chickens as a protein source. Chickens are actually an amazing protein source because you can't only eat the chicken, but you can also eat the eggs, okay? So that's awesome. But what happened is that chickens don't feed off the natural terrain in southwest Uganda. So families who were given the chickens then had to go and buy chicken feed to keep the chickens alive. Well, the chicken feed costs more than the chickens are worth or than the, the eggs are worth at market. So the entire equation didn't work and the chickens didn't do so well. So our local partner, Dr. Jeffrey Anguyo, who's in Kabale, he saw this happen in his own community. He said, we do need a new protein source, but let's try rabbits. Because Southwest Uganda is actually very lush, and rabbits eat off the natural terrain. So they're much lower cost to maintain. And so Dr. Anguyo and his colleagues developed rabbit breeding centers, an entire rabbit program, and have, have, have integrated rabbits into the diet through a rabbit restaurant, because it wasn't something that people were eating before, so you had to think about flavoring the rabbits in a way that people would actually eat it. Bunnies also reproduce quickly, as the saying goes. So it's something, it's a, it's, it's, it was able to be scaled up fairly quickly. And now they're studying the children of families who have rabbits, and they're actually able to show that the protein calorie malnutrition has gone down. So these are the type of on the ground realities that we have to understand so that our interventions are effective. The next pearl is appreciate the stepping stones necessary for sustained impact. Particularly in clinical settings, it can be very tempting for us to try and be an immediate fix to health issues. And this is something that the authoritarian post, The Onion, picked up on in 2014 with this article titled, New Doctors Without Licenses Program Provides Incompetent Medical Care to Refugees. So while it can be very enticing to try and do medical treatments and deliver them as an undergraduate or as a medical student or even as a, as a licensed physician who's used to practicing in a different setting, that actually, I'm gonna argue, is not contributing meaningfully to sustainable global health interventions. We need health systems. We need to play roles that are beyond clinical roles because all, at the end of the day, a clinician is only really useful, if they're seeing patients, they're only being useful for that finite time period. And what we need in global health is capacity building and we also need to avoid reinforcing the differential standard of care for the poor and reinforcing that an undergraduate student um, is, is an appropriate doctor for a patient because they're in a poor setting or because they are uh, disempowered for whatever reason. So you and I, you're sitting here in Washington, D.C., I assume many of you are probably from the U.S., we carry a lot of power and privilege with us when we put ourselves down in other settings. And we often carry additional power and privilege when we're professionals, such as doctors, nurses, um, MBAs, administrators, whatever it is. And so we have to be conscious that we have to use that in a way that's actually constructive and mindful and isn't trying to um, supersede our level of expertise. The next thing is to develop both soft and hard skills. And we heard a little bit about this um, when Barbara was talking. So the way I think about soft and hard skills, I think about hard skills as what you do and soft skills as how you do it. And I think about it for the researchers in the room, I think of hard skills as kind of the quantitative skills that you have. And soft skills are your qualitative skills, okay? And it really becomes an art form to be effective um, in, in addressing difficult global health challenges. And 
Um, I'm going to just point out, this is a Domains of Competency for Global Health. This is an article that was published last year in um, the Annals of Global Health. So there's 11 domains of, of competence. Three of them are, are very well connected to soft skills, so collaboration, partnering, communication, ethics, professional practice. So just remembering that not only do you want to develop skills that are technical, like what Barbara was talking about, and that can happen far outside the realm of global health and be brought to global health to be very effective, but also um, developing yourself as someone who can work cross-culturally, someone who has uh, diplomacy, someone who has tolerance for, you know, lack of running water and a variety of other things that you may encounter in less resource settings. With regard to hard skills, one of the things that the questions that I often get is like, what degree should I get if I want to go into global health? Or what should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? Many students who want to go to med school because they think that's the route to global health. So this is a study we did last year looking at job opportunities in global health. And granted, this is a subset because these are employers that are advertising online for very explicit international positions. But what you can see here is that about 50% of the positions are related to public health disciplines. 27% were related to business and administrative disciplines. Only 14% were related to clinical disciplines. And so while I'm a physician, I don't want to become the poster child for what you need to do to get to global health. Because the reality is that going to medical school, learning to practice here, we are increasingly diverging in the relevancy of how we practice medicine here from the relevancy of how medicine needs to be practiced if we really want to achieve global health equity. So my way of working up um, a stroke involves the first thing I do is I order a CT scan. Well, in most countries of the world, particularly in low and middle income countries, that step is not even available to me. So I am not as irrelevant as I think I might be just because I have the MD. And so while going to medical school and being a doctor is amazing for a lot of other reasons, it shouldn't be the automated, um, the automated career path for those wanting to go into global health. In addition, when you look at what skills are being demanded, well, overwhelmingly, 58% of the skill set require senior program management and direction, and the other 28% require supportive program functions. So what does that mean? It means building the leadership skills that Barbara talked about, learning how to manage a large group of people that are, that are spread out maybe around the world or around a country or around a community, how to track data, how to have goals and, and measure achievement towards goals, basically project management and other um, administrative functions. And sometimes we can, when I'm hiring for CFHI, our Global Health Scholars programs are open to undergraduates graduate and postgraduate students, really kind of regardless of, of your skill set. But when I'm hiring for my team, I am getting flooded with applications that have a variety of different global health related degrees. What I'm finding is that often the technical skill set is missing. And so while you have, they, the, the applicant may have an awesome theoretical understanding of global health, when it's like, okay, what have you done and, and what skill set can you bring to CFHI, those are sometimes missing. So we can talk more about that in the discussion section, but I just want to encourage you to not only just follow traditional global health labeled career paths, but to really think about developing yourself as an effective team member, effective leader regardless of the context. So I'm going to leave you, um, CFHI's tagline is let the world change you and my background is in anthropology and I just think that we always, um, we always want to impact and catalyze, catalyze change and I think we can be important catalysts. But um, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, we need to remember that the world is changing us as much as we are able to change it. And with those lessons, we can advocate and be spokesperson for health equity and social justice much more effectively. Thank you. So I just realized I've made a huge mistake, and that was uh, putting myself behind two brilliant women. <laughs> really not a smart thing to do. Um, I'm going to ask you to... Thanks. So I'm going to talk about... All of this stuff. <laughs> I'm just giving you a little preview. Mm -hmm. 
then I'm going to ask somebody who has more technical skill than I do to bring it to the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> he, he apologizes to me as if it's his fault. <laughs> That's great. So I'm going to talk about the Global Health Fellows. <laughs> it's really great. You'll do well in Global Health. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Global Health Fellows Program and some of the lessons we've learned, but mostly talk about you and careers and how it all works uh, and what we're learning along the way. Um, Doesn't want to go to the next. Doesn't want to go. What? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna talk to this picture. Um, Global Health Fellows Program has two big mandates. One is to uh, um, meet USAID's. It's a cooperative agreement funded by the United States Agency for International Development to meet their human capacity needs, uh, which are, they never have enough people to do the work. They are spending through five to six billion dollars a year in global health. Uh, and so uh, one of the ways that they use fellows is to help them do their, the work that needs to be done. Uh, and so we help build that human capacity inside their organization in Washington and in the missions overseas. We do that in a couple different ways. We do that with fellowships, and we do that with um, um, internships. Fellowships are uh, two to four years. They're full-time jobs. They're early career to the apex, the c very senior staff. Uh, internships are three to three months to a year. They're also paid, and uh, they're primarily in uh, Washington, D.C., but uh, the work that they do also uh, provides them the requirement to go overseas at least once. Um, the, unfortunately, because the jobs are inside uh, USAID, uh, th they're required to have secret security clearance, which means that you need to be an American citizen or a permanent resident. Uh, we also have other programs. We have a corporate volunteer program. We run the Foreign Service National Fellowship Program. Uh, we're starting up a residency program inside USAID as well. Uh, we work with at-risk high school kids uh, around uh, creating a vision for a career in global health with them as well. And we work with undergraduates too through the Globe Med program. And we're partners with the Global Health Corps. Um, but we have this other thing that we do. And it's the second big mandate that we have. It's about building the next generation of global health professionals. Uh, within that is two pieces. One is a diversity initiative. USAID wants the global health profession to represent the American people as well. Uh, and so uh, we, we've, uh, uh, have done a number of different things working with minority serving institutions, to introduce this concept uh, of a pathway to global health careers. Uh, we work with the USAID staff who um, help us recruit and support uh, global health professionals. And uh, one of the turns that that has taken is work in the, in the area of unconscious bias. Um, and because of that work we do, over 47% of our fellows identify as diverse. So. Um, it's working uh, for us in that area. The other area that I want to talk about, the other initiative, is evolving the future of global health professionals. Uh, the, over time, we've developed a kind of competency uh, framework that we operate from. I want to uh, point out, it's, it's a simple framework. Um, but it's important, and we use it in self-assessment and uh, in performance management over the life of a, of a program, of a fellow, so excuse me. And it starts with the, probably the easiest thing is um, health expertise. 
which you'll see at the top of that cycle. Health expertise is what academia does the best at, uh, relevant technical health areas, key populations. You, those of you that are, are students, how many are grad students in global health? Okay, so you're getting a lot of that, and that's really important uh, that you have uh, some technical depth. We're learning that as the careers evolve in global health, one of those key areas that uh, continue to help you be marketable is when you have a depth, a unique depth, in a particular technical area or a particular a specific population. Uh, another competency is knowledge management. And that's, that's the ability to identify, manage, and access relevant technical content. So you know all this stuff, you graduate, right? But the problem is that new data, new information is coming in all the time. And so you need a set of skills to develop, to develop how to access that. You know, the total sum of all human knowledge used to double every 400 years. Now it's every six months, according to the RAND Corporation. So, and if you ever uh, struggle with managing your emails, uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, how do you know where to get the best information in an efficient way? That is a competency that we want to pay attention to. Another competency is process and resource optimization. That's a funny name, but it's really about your knowledge about funding. If this, is a, this is a knowledge thing, but then it's how you apply it. Funding mechanisms. How does the money flow in global health? It's really important to understand that. What are the industry dynamics? How do you write a proposal? It's implementation science, which we talk a, a fair amount about. And monitoring the valuation, including data analytics, which is really popular right now, and dissemination. So that's a skill cluster that you want to pay attention to. Another one is professional capabilities. This is the inside stuff, okay? This is your internal world. Uh, it's your ability to write and to speak, absolutely crucial. But also your self-management, your emotional intelligence, your self-awareness, your self-control, and all those sort of qualities that uh, I learned about when we were looking, doing research in cross-cultural adaptation, your flexibility, your ability to tolerate ambiguity, your persistence. I think it's one of those important qualities in, in global health, sort of like when, when you hit a wall here, you know, your ability to sort of rethink. I see some seasoned people uh, acknowledging the importance of that. And then there's that interpersonal effectiveness how you relate with others. It's absolutely crucial that your ability to collaborate and be a member of a team is honed, and it's a learned skill. This is something that you actually can master. The problem is this doesn't tend to be focused on in uh, your programming, and it's absolutely crucial. Over the course of the 15 years that I've run fellowship programs, when I've had to fire fellows, there I'm firing employees, I'm their supervisor, I'm firing them. I never have fired a person because they weren't smart enough or because they weren't technically competent. I have had to let people go because they didn't know how to be a good team member. They weren't able to collaborate. And I'm talking early career and very, very seasoned senior people. So those qualities are very important, and uh, we've learned these lessons over time. I want to talk to you about what we've been noticing and get you, I want to kind of get you in on this issue because it's important for you to understand as you navigate your own career what's happening. Uh, the Global Health Fellows Program, um, and I want to just acknowledge the um, communication outreach and diversity staff who are here uh, Angelina, could you just wave your hand so people know? She's our director. And Maribel and Sylvie, Sylvie, uh, Sylvie yeah, the, 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 our pho photographer, who, they do all this work. We do between 50 and 80 outreach events a year, which when we're going to the universities. And to, you know, we have booze. Many of you have sort of seen us uh, uh, talk our talk at, at those events, talking about glo global health. What we discovered over the course of the years of doing this work is there's more and more universities doing this stuff. Um, according to the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, 
In 2001, there were six global health programs in academia. In 2011, there were 78. There's now 250. So we're graduating more and more students in global health. But then we see the other side, the back end uh, of the situation, where jobs for global health professionals, especially American global health, are decreasing. More and more of those positions are going to nationals, as they should in international development. Country directors, chiefs of party, they're going to nationals. So what are you doing? How do you navigate this tightening career environment? Uh, I'm going to add some more information. Uh, we did a study. We talked to 49 uh, global health directors about their hiring practices. And what they said is that 85% of academ academia can and should do a better job of preparing global health professionals. They said what's missing are the important non-clinical skills, the non-health expertise skills. And these were their priorities. Project management, knowing how to run a project, collaboration and teamwork, really sophisticated skills in how you bring a group together, how you create teams, communication with counterparts in community, and s developing strategy and project design. So I just want you to know, if you're an undergraduate looking at programs, think about those skills. The other thing they said is, here's their traditional in-service training program content. They teach, they have to teach people how to do project design and management, how to do monitoring and evaluation, partially because that technical skill is evolving all the time. Writing is an important skill that they have to teach. Collaboration and teamwork, leadership and supervision, and then research and analysis, again, primarily because that field is evolving so quickly. So here's some things that you can do. If you're looking for an academic program, look at where the faculty is spending their time. Are they flying overseas? Are they getting their funding from NIH? There are indicators that they're primarily doing research. If you want to do research, that's the good fit for you. But if you want to do development, you need to look at programs where people have long-term relationships and are doing work overseas over time. They're actually doing development. You also want to pay attention to overseas practical experience. A lot of schools now are uh, providing uh, global health training by giving you practicums in immigrant communities or low resource environments locally. Global health employers say that's not going to work. First of all, they don't need that because they can get, the, the market is so great, they can get people, and many of you here who's had overseas living and working experience matter, but those of you who don't, you have to try to get that while you're in grad school, if possible. It's really important, even in early career. Also, you have the ability to influence. If you've only had domestic experience, you've gotten a degree, and you want to go into global health, you need to influence how employers think about your domestic experience, because they think you don't, you, they think you have issues with cultural acumen. They think you have issues with uh, interpersonal interactions. They think you have issues with, um, teams and working in, in a collaborative environment, which is completely not true. The other area that you want to pay attention to and collect data on is global health trends. Like, what is the big picture? What we, we're like the canary in the mine for that. We were hiring vets when uh, animal-borne disease started coming up. Um, we were hiring, hiring engineers, now we're hiring MBAs, now we're hiring people that have technical depth in data analytics, which I hardly know what that means, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> and design thinking, too, it's like very sexy right now. Uh, okay, so that's the outside data that you want to collect. The inside data is, and this is my absolutely best career advice to you, this is an inquiry of three questions that you can ask yourself over the course of your life, because as uh, Barbara said, your career thinking changes over time. Number one, what are you good at? What's your, what is your technical talent? It's not only what you think you're good at, but what do other people say that you're good at, too? So you start collecting that. The second question you ask yourself is, what do you love? Like, when you really, like, you're in the zone, right? You're just like, mm, this is, like, so good. 
that, you know, nobody loves every part of their job all day, but there are some things that just know this is where you were meant to be, this is what you were meant to do. Pay attention. And in order to know these, the answers to these two questions, you need an awake inner observer. You need, self, you need the skill of self-reflection. You need to be awake to yourself as you're walking through your life, as you're walking through your, your work world and your personal life too, because that always factors into what we do professionally. And the third question is, where do you need to be geographically? You know, sometimes you need to be overseas. Sometimes you need to be back in the States. Sometimes you need to be in this country. Sometimes you need to be in that, do that work. And the answers to that, sometimes it's aging parents that bring you back. Sometimes it's kids that bring you back. Sometimes it's a bad relationship that makes you want to go over. So, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm just, that was just a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. It's like when you're in the job interview.